Hey y'all, this is Miss Hill, and welcome to our first geometry video. We're going to start by talking about why we study geometry. Uh, first and foremost, it is very practical and very applicable. It's a concrete thing. It exists in the world around you. You just pick your head up and look around, and you're going to see geometry in action, right? If you want to design anything, construct anything, build anything, decorate anything, uh, draw something, right? You're going to need the principles and concepts of geometry. Now, because it is so concrete and so real world, it's actually the perfect vehicle to start improving your logic and reasoning by building an axiomatic system and learning how to do something called a proof. The way geometry is structured is we start with some basic concepts and ideas and build off of it uh, using logic, and reasoning, and proving things along the way. And so the process of going through that building of geometry will help you improve your reasoning abilities, hopefully. And my favorite aspect of learning geometry is basically to improve as problem solvers. Because if you go back and think about learning algebra, it was a lot of like, here's this skill. Now practice this skill. Now take a quiz on this skill. Maybe there's an application problem, but they seemed kind of forced and weird. Geometry is not like that at all. In geometry, you focus on learning concepts and properties. Um, in a rigorous way, and then you figure out how to apply them in different ways. So you're not going to be given 30 of the same problem to practice. That defeats the purpose. So what you have to do instead is make observations, see what you're given, make a catalog of the things that you have, and then reason through what that gives you. So I have these two things, which if, oh, if I have these two things, then I know this third thing has to be true. Like that's the kind of reasoning you're gonna do and you're gonna do it repeatedly. This process of observing using reasoning, observing using reasoning is hopefully gonna make you a better problem solver. And most importantly, when I say better problem solver, more efficient problem solver, help you find better pathways. And some of you, this is gonna be uncomfortable. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, that happened in geometry. Um, so I wrote this question in this one unit. I, I put it on the test. I put it early in the test because I thought it was an easy question. Um, because if you use the concept that you learned in that unit, it was literally two steps. Count some stuff and then multiply the stuff together and then done. But you could also do this problem using algebra. But if you used algebra, you ended up with like 12 steps including like solving a system of equations. And whenever you have that much complexity in a problem, people are going to get stuff wrong along the way. You're going to drop a sign someplace, miswrite a number, intermediate round. It's crazy. And the people who did that, I asked like, okay, so that question was like two steps. Why did you take 20? And they're like, oh, because I'm more comfortable with the algebra. We spent a whole year on algebra. I do Kumon. I'm really good with algebra. I'm like, but you got the problem wrong and you spent 15 minutes on it when I wanted you to spend 30 seconds. So you're going to have to go outside of your comfort zone and make sure that you learn the concepts of each unit as we go along to become a better problem solver. Now, I've mentioned this thing, reasoning, quite often. And so let's talk about reasoning for a second. And there are really two types of reasoning. And you've done each of these types. You probably haven't named it before. The first type of reasoning is inductive reasoning. And this is something you use in your daily life. You observe things in the world around you. You recognize things, patterns. So you kind of have a sense of what's going on. And you make predictions of what might happen and generalizations. Like you do this every day of your life. Science uses inductive reasoning, right? They observe, they recognize patterns, they collect data, they make predictions, and they make generalizations, which we call conjectures, by the way. You start off inductive reasoning, observing what you're given, make some generalizations. Now, once you have the generalizations, the important part, the, the super mathy and the harder part, is to then use deductive reasoning to prove it's true. And basically, this is to show a conclusion logically follows from its hypothesis where you justify each and every step. Okay, and you've done this before too. You've actually done this in algebra. Whenever we asked you to solve an equation, like the equation was the hypothesis, right? And each line of work that you were supposed to show had a justification. Like, oh, I combined like terms. I distributed. I divided both sides. I subtracted this from both sides. And then therefore, I came up with the answer of x equals 3. Right? That process of solving using properties of equality is deductive reasoning. Okay. 
So this leads to the question of, well, how do we justify and prove things are true in geometry? So we use things as our justifications, right? We can use definitions. Definition of attraction, order of operations, right? Definition of a rectangle. We use definitions all of the time. Now, in geometry, you're going to find that there are quite a few definitions. Oh, I, I haven't counted how many, but there's an order of magnitude greater than the number of definitions you had in Algebra 1. And ironically enough, all of your geometry definitions have been built off three undefined terms. Now, when we say undefined terms, we just mean they're really hard to define without using the word itself. So they are point, line, and plane, and I challenge you to define a point without using the word point or a synonym for point. It's really tough. But uh, we kind of intuitively know what point lines and planes are, and so we just kind of build off of that. Now, another thing we can use for justification is something called an axiom, also known as a postulate. And the type of geometry we study is called Euclidean geometry because the first book that kind of codified this, this uh, way of studying geometry was written by a guy named Euclid. Uh, and so he called them postulates. He had 13. And a postulate or an axiom are things that we accept as true. We just no need to prove it. I know it's true. Like intuitively, I know it's true. So for example, the commutative property of addition. A plus B equals B plus A. Of course, 2 plus 3 equals 3 plus 2. You don't have to prove that to me. I know that's true, right? That's an example of an axiom from algebra. And geometry, an, an example of a postulate of geometry, is that if I have two distinct points, then exactly one line can be drawn between and containing those two points, right? That's kind of something I kind of know is true through observation. I can't prove it. I just kind of know it's true. So I can always use an axiom to prove things as justification as a proof. And then, of course, we have our properties of equality, which we're going to extend to this idea of congruence in geometry. Equality relates to quantities, like numbers are equal. Uh, equations can be equal because they represent quantities on two sides. Congruence represents objects or shapes. So two shapes can be congruent, meaning they're basically the same shape and same size, um, like two squares of side length of one are congruent squares. So congruence for objects, equality for like numbers. And so let's look at the properties of equality. You know four, the addition property of equality and multiplication property of equality, which you use when you solve equations. Subtraction and division, kind of like, kind of there also, but not really when you get past geometry. Um, and then of course we have the properties of equality that seem super obvious that you don't use in Algebra 1, but you're gonna use a lot when you start proving stuff is true. Um, first one, it, it's like super obvious, like uh, the reflexive property, which says A equals A. Something is equal to itself, okay? Awesome. And then symmetric property says if A equals B, then B equals A. Uh, okay, you just swapped uh, which side of the equals the, the things were, okay? And, and, the, and the fun one is a transitive property, which uh, allows you to create a chain of equality or congruence. This is the fun one, and you're gonna use this one more often in geometry. If A equals B and B equals C, then A has to equal C. It creates that chain, right, of equality. Transitive, put a, like a little highlighter on this one, like star it or something, whenever you need to like connect some chains, transitive is what you want. Uh, and so we can always use these to help us prove things. And then finally, previously proven conjectures. And this is the building of the axiomatic systems, right? We're gonna start off with geometry with some definitions and some axioms, and there's gonna be a couple of like properties that we're gonna trickle in, but then those properties can be used to prove other properties, which can be used to prove other properties. So we're gonna start off with like angles and then go to parallel lines, and then parallel lines go to triangles, and then from triangles go to quadrilaterals, and from quadrilaterals go to polygons, and polygons go to circles. And it's like this chain where we can use things that we've previously proven. So when we get to like, proving circle conjectures, you're gonna use triangle conjectures, right? That we did, proved a long time ago. Um, but they have to be proven before you can use them as justification. You just can't make stuff up. And speaking of conjectures, there's a special language in which they are written. So we're gonna talk about this now uh, because when we actually start geometry, I expect you to be able to understand what a conjecture is giving you, okay? So conjectures are usually written as conditional statements, meaning there's a condition that has to be met for something to be true. And there are three main types of conditional statements that you'll see. Uh, there's the if-then form, there's the only if form, and the if and only if form, okay? So the most common one we're gonna see is the if-then form. 
in geometry at least. And sometimes it's not if then. Sometimes it starts off given then, right? To make it explicit that you are given this thing, then therefore this other thing has to be true. And so the parts of the statement are called hypothesis and conclusion. If hypothesis, this is the thing I'm given, then conclusion. Okay, so this is the structure of most of the conjectures, or it'll be given hypothesis, then conclusion. Um, and logically, when you get to actually study logic, they kind of get rid of the words and start using symbols. So logically, the if-then statement is H arrow C. That means the hypothesis leads to the conclusion. Now, we're not going to talk about only if, and we're going to briefly talk about if and only if because we don't see these very often. Now, here's some examples. If a quadrilateral is a square, then it is also a rectangle. And I chose this because it's like the classic argument. Every square is a rectangle, but not every rectangle is a square. And so this gives me a conditional statement that I can verify is true. If I'm given a quadrilateral, then it's, that it's a square, then it's a rectangle. And then I'm going to use this other one, a famous one, a named one. If A and B are lengths of legs and C is the length of the hypotenuse of a right triangle, then A squared plus B squared equals C squared. This is also a conjecture. Now the hypothesis of this one is that I have a right triangle where A, B, and C are side lengths. And the conclusion is A squared plus B squared equals C squared. Okay. This one has a name. It's called the Pythagorean theorem. You should know it. Um, this other one doesn't have a name. Doesn't make it less true. But sometimes our conjectures will have names, yay, and sometimes they won't. And you'll notice in the series of videos that our conjectures are going to be numbered. Um, that's because some of them have names and some of them don't. And that's also because they have to go in a specific order, right? It goes back to that idea that you can only prove things on stuff you knew beforehand, right? So there's an order to the conjecture, so they'll have a number. You don't have to know the number of the conjecture. You, if it has a fancy name, you gotta know the name, like Pythagorean theorem, you gotta know that thing by name. But if you know the, the meat and potatoes of the conjecture, like if you know the property that the conjecture is talking about, then you're cool. You don't have to memorize any numbers. Now, with conditional statements, often gets thrown out three other words. One of them we're going to see quite often, converse. Two others you don't see as often, but I'm just going to throw them out there so you, you know you've heard them before. Uh, inverse and contrapositive. Now, this goes to the study of just pure logic, right? So a converse uh, is a statement where you swap the hypothesis and the conclusion. So in this case, for the Pythagorean theorem, it would be like if a squared plus b squared equals c squared, then right triangle would be the converse. An inverse is the same order, but you negate things. So you put like a not in front of, in front of things. So for example, if a quadrilateral is not a square, then it is not a rectangle, right? That is an example of... Uh, an inverse, you just negate the hypothesis and conclusion. And the contrapositive is where you do both, where you negate it and you swap it. So it would be like, if I don't have a rectangle, then I don't have a square, right? That would be the contrapositive of this first one. Now let's talk about the logic of things, okay? Because one of the things that you have to do, especially in the beginning of geometry, is uh, evaluate the truthiness of a statement, logically speaking, and knowing definitions and things. So um, if I am given a square, then a square is a rectangle is the original statement, which I know is true, right? One of the ways we define squares is, uh, is a rectangle with all sides being equal length, right? So it's true. Now, converses can be true or false. Okay, so one thing I can do is I can give you a conjecture, I can find the converse of it and throw that at you, true or false. Sometimes they're true, sometimes they're false. In this case, it's going to be false because if I'm given a rectangle, it doesn't mean that I have a square. I can just have like a, I just have a rectangle. It could be long and skinny, whatever. Now the inverse would be if I'm not given a square, then I'm not given a rectangle, which is also false, right? In this case, it's false um, because just because it's not a square, it could be a long, skinny rectangle, right? And then a contrapositive, logically speaking, uh, in this case, if not a rectangle, then not a square. This is true, okay? If I don't have a rectangle, then I don't have a square. Now, when we do true or false statements, right, if you have the original statement, like a conjecture you know is true, the converse may or may not be true, depending on the statement. The inverse may or may not be true, depending on the statement. So you have to think about these two. But the contrapositive is always going to be true, logically speaking. Now, I'm going to stop this video by talking about a couple takeaways from this conditional statements and if-thens, okay? 
So if this is the first one. If the original statement is true, if the original if-then statement is true, logically the contrapositive must also be true. And the second thing is that if the original statement and the converse are both true, I can rewrite that can those two conditional statements into a single conditional statement using the phrase if and only if. Okay, so something if and only if something else means the original statement and the converse are both true, works both ways. Okay, and if I'm really lazy, sometimes you will see me write this if and only if, but uh, I will write it as IFF because that's like the shorthand version when we have a, a conjecture that's true along with its converse. Okay, so now your job is to go back and make sure that you understood what we talked about in this video, that you have the vocabulary written down um, because this is the basis of, of how we study geometry. And uh, good luck, everybody.